Thank you very, very much, Sol. You've, you've also become a pleasant ritual. Um, so thank you, Talking Galleries. Um, and thank you all for staying uh, for the last session uh, to talk about dead artists. But hopefully also, <laughs> what we, hopefully also what we will be talking about is applying that to uh, living artists and very much to, uh, to living gallerists. Um, uh, I certainly am aware that artist estates have been very, very much in the news these past couple of years. Um, I get a lot more press releases telling me about a gallery winning an artist estate now than I get about a young, hot artists. And they are clearly fairly lucrative business, but they are also fairly complicated and can be very challenging. Um, I was just, I'm, I'm based in London and I just met Frank Lloyd, who uh, looks at who manages the estate of Craig Kaufman? Mm. He has a show on in London at the moment, um, and I asked him, you know, what was it like when you first got the estate? And he very happily he said it was a total mess. Mm -hmm. And my amazing speakers uh, and panelists uh, this evening um, are here to help. I hope avoid the total mess. Um, <laughs> We're going to start, as you can see, Helen Vandenberg, who is already at the podium. Um, she is going to talk to us about the Institute for Artist Estates, uh, to which she is an advisor. But she is also the daughter of Philippe Vandenberg and helps ma manages his estate. Um, so hopefully we'll also get that perspective too. And then on my far right, we have Natasha Heber, who also has, uh, <laughs> has two Im very important roles. Um, she runs Tony Tapia's gallery here in Barcelona, um, but also is, um, runs the managers, sorry, the estate of uh, Anthony Tapia's. Um, and then next to her, we have Christy McClare, who um, certainly surprised me, but I think surprised everybody when she left from being chief executive of the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation to join uh, Art Agency Partners, which is a subsidiary of the, the, the advisory subsidiary of Sotheby's. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about that. Uh, and then uh, another talking galleries friend, uh, but uh, superb gallerist, Adam Sheffer, who is a partner at Kyman Reed in New York. They look after the trust of Louise Bourgeois, um, the foundation of Joan Mitchell, and many others uh, that I'm sure he'll talk about. And Adam is also president of the Art Dealers Association of America, ADAA. So this really is a phenomenal panel. Um, I'm thrilled to have you all to speak to today. And Helen, I would be very happy for you to kick off to tell us what the uh, artist's estate does. does. Institute of Artists Estates. If we've got the yes, we do. Thank you. Okay. So, Andy Warhol once said, "What did he say?" <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> they so told us that what the exact words were. It's obvious. Was that was the it exact was. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yes. That can make you look like a star. <laughs> <laughs> and somewhere he was right. Estates, sorry, estates have never been so important, and their importance will even grow in the future. They have even become owned players in the art market, and as the art world has professionalized, so has the management of estates. But this growth and this professionalization brought a lot of questions. How to start? Which model do we use? The sunset model? The eternity model? Is the family in charge? Yes or no? How to organize a studio after the death of the artist? What kind of database? How to deal with authentication? Yes, no? How to work with the gallery? As a gallery, how to work with the artist, children? And so on and so on. So to give you an answer to all these questions, we started the Institute of the Artist Estates. We started in 2015, and we are located in Berlin, but we work worldwide. We work with a lot of people, but the core of the institute is really us four. Two lawyers, Dr. Loretta Wurtenberger, who is the director of the institute, and Carl von, Trop, von Trott, uh, one economist, Daniel Temple, and myself. I'm an art historian, and I work as an advisor for the institute. 
it's important to know that the four of us has all personal engagements with the states. So, for example, in my case, it's now for eight years that I'm working for the estate of my father, together with my two brothers. He was a Belgian uh, painter, Philippe Vandenberg. And it's really through the, uh, because of my work uh, with the estate that I came in contact with a lot of other estates, with heirs, with children, of artists, with artists, with people who work with estates. And I really felt the need, and I can say this for my three colleagues also, we really felt the need to share our experiences and to professionalize the estate world. Because you have to know, at that time, there was no point where you could go with all your questions. And it's actually, it was a really lonely job to work for an estate. So I'm really proud to say that we are the first and the only institute in Europe who focuses on all matters of estates. So for who do we work? We work for artists, of course, for heirs, for galleries, and for other professionals like lawyers, notary, but also museum directors, the government. So what do we do? We focus on three pillars, education and connection. The uh, second one is research and publications, and the third pillar is consulting and management. It's important to know that the consulting and management pillar allows us to pay for the first two pillars, so for the education and connection and the research and publications. So let's focus on education and connection. We organize every two years an international um, um, conference, and it's like an international platform to learn and to connect from peer to peer. So our first conference was in Berlin, 2016. Maybe some of you were even uh, there. It was, uh, the title was Keeping the Legacy Alive. And these are some of the speakers. I'm sure you all know them. Or anyway, you will know the estates that they represent. It was a huge success, actually. We had more than 250 estates from everywhere in the world who came to attend uh, the conference. And our second conference will be now, in the fall, in Los Angeles. And it will focus on uh, new perspectives. A second thing we organize is workshops. We do, every year, um, very in-depth trainings it's for 25 people, not more. And they take four or five days. And our first training was in uh, London now. And um, as you can see, we always try to work with uh, um, partners who are linked with, funda with foundation with the state. So we had the Henry Moore Foundation, of course, the Lynn Shadwick Estate, the Cocteau Institute, and Christie's. That was now in London. These are some images. This, was, uh, this is Andrea Theil from the Liechtenstein Foundation. She's a master on catalogue raisonné. If you ever want to know something on catalogue raisonné, just ask Andrea. And this is a picture of all of us in front of the Lynn Chadwick estate. It's a beautiful castle out of London. If you can go once, you really have to go. It's a garden, it's beautiful, the art inside. It's a lot of Lynn Chadwick, of course. But just to have an idea. Our next workshop will be in Berlin in June now. And some of the speakers will be uh, Chavon Necklace from the John Mitchell estate, Andrea Theil the master in, f in catalog raisonné. Tri Chris Dercon also, um, you all know him as the former director of uh, the Tate, and as uh, director of the Tate, he was in contact with a lot of states, uh, of the states, of course. And then the locations, the Hans Ach Foundation, Gerhard Richter Archive, some artist studios, so we really, for us it's very important to have the workshops in these locations. So research and publications, the second pillar, we do a lot of interviews. It's an <laughs> ongoing series of interviews. The, uh, the last one was <laughs> with Natasha. Um, you, you just uh, you know who she is now, of course. And then we do a lot of lectures also at um, universities throughout Europe, in Milano, in Zurich, in London, in Berlin. And then our book, um, the book The Artist Estate. It's a handbook for artists and for everybody who works with the states. Mm -hmm. So um, if you won't make it to our conferences or workshops and you still have a lot of questions, I would say buy the book. It's, uh, it's a great, it's based on interviews with people who work for an estate. 
and then it's a guideline based on these interviews. The third pillar is consulting and management. So I choose uh, as examples three complete different artists that we uh, consult. One artist who already passed away, Gerard Marx, of course, but then we have Wim Wenders, who is a filmmaker, and Random International, and I choose this too because, um, like for example, Random International, they're quite young artists, but they work with digital arts more. It's, uh, I think you all know the Rain Room that they do, and it's a complete different way of, of uh, working for an estate of this kind of work than, for example, for a sculptor or a painter. Same thing for Wim Wenders. It's a different way. How, how, how will you uh, organize your estate then? So there are, and these are three examples of, of estates that we really manage ourselves. And also here, um, they're completely different. You have Hans Arp, you all know, of course, Sophie Tauber Arp, an incredible artist that, um, not, that is now getting famous. I'm very happy because she's super. And then you have Kate Arnett. It's a conceptual artist. You all know him from the 60s. Completely different again. How do you manage in a state of a conceptual artist? A lot of other questions than we have with Hans Arp, for example. So to conclude a very short presentation, I would like to say that I'm really convinced that if we want to protect, to guarantee the heritage for our future, we really need professional support for the heirs, for the artists, for people who work with the states. And that is something that we try to do with the Institute. So please, if you have some questions of on, on our workshops, on the conferences or whatever, please don't uh, hesitate to contact me or my colleagues in uh, Berlin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Helen, I, I already have a question. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, uh, but one of my questions, do you, do you mind just, I think I understand the sunset versus eternity model that you raised at the beginning. Um, but do you mind, is, is that just this idea that do you keep going yes. forever? Or do you say the legacy runs a certain number of years? And if so, how many? The how sunset many? model, is, it's actually like a sunset, you know. The <laughs> sun goes up and it goes down. So it's... It's that you decide that um, you will work for a certain amount of years. It, it can, def yeah, you can choose whatever. It can be 50, it can be 20, it can be mm. 80 years. And then you say, and then we stop. And the eternity model is like the Picasso estate or yes. I suppose it's Rauschenberg <laughs> estates and so on. So um, they just go on. Some and in a lot of cases, they transform. In a museum, I was wondering that, yes, in the or, of the or the the works goes to to a foundation that does certain topics. So um, and then the the sunset model just stops. It's really focused on these artists, mm. and when they reached a certain level, I don't know. Yeah, if no, that makes complete sense. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and um, Natasha, I was just wondering on on listening to that. Um, I mean, do you, if you could explain to us a little bit how. Anthony Tepiez's as a state is because I think you are quite professionalized. Yes. But would you would you have benefited from this sort of advice uh, in actually 2012? Uh, with not in no. in 12. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 I, yeah, because we've been working for like uh, six years now on the on the estate. Uh, it was very well organized. So even though it was well organized, these six years we've been working nonstop. So it's really a lot of work. But actually, we're talking with an artist who was extremely fertile. So it's really a lot of work. So actually, uh, what's what's interesting about our model, which is kind of different from other models, where you have like the foundation who kind of owns everything, or the family owns everything. In our model, we have some different little companies. So actually what happened is that uh, Tapies was really uh, well organized from very early in his career. So in, this, in the 70s, he was already, already thinking about the catalogue raisonné. So at the end of the 70s, they really started working on, on this book. So that was, uh, he was quite alive and he had all these pictures. So he was really aware of what he was doing. So by the end of the 80s, he built uh, another company, which was uh, Antonita Biasi Familia. That was, at the beginning, uh, a tax company. 
So actually the idea was that all of his artwork will directly go to this company and will be sold through this company. And, and when you said sorry, when you said tax company, as I, it, I mean, it, I mean, it, it was lowered it, it lowered tax bill. company. Okay. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, so the idea also was to start to involve member of the family uh, in this company, which is uh, actually in 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 Spain. It's very usual to have like big family businesses. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't out of uh, out of, of of the blue. It was kind of. A, so this was the end of the 80s, and then at the beginning of the 90s, there was the creation of the foundation, which was another thing. So the, the family business is a for, for profit business, and the foundation is non-profit. So the foundation was built uh, by Anthony Tapies. Uh, Anthony Tapies gave a big part of his, uh, of his work. It's uh, followed work, so you have all the years, and it's a very well-organized collection that was given to the foundation with the participation of the city of Barcelona, Generalitat, and the government of Spain. So that was the idea to, to build something that would be half private, half public. So this was for the, for the foundation. And the, at that time, the foundation would uh, give the certificate uh, for the artwork until a certain point where they thought that maybe certificates should be taken out of the foundation. And there was another business that was created. It was, it was called the Comissio Tapies, which is a very professional business with lawyers and you know, professionals who are looking at the work, who are uh, giving this uh, certificate. Awesome. And it's also the commission who has the rights. And are you involved in that at all? I mean, presumably you still have a say over the authenticity? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're okay. They're the final. Yes. And then um, I was just wondering, one, cause, because one of the questions up there was family or not family, <laughs> and I wondered if maybe being a, being an in-law, the, the daughter in the Tetris, the daughter in law yeah. of Tapias, does that, does that make you sort of family but not too family? Because how does that, <laughs> how does that work? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's, yeah, it's, it's very helpful. Uh, it's helpful that I, I like to talk, I like people, I like <laughs> public relations, so this is, uh, and I like management, I like all these things. So I, I'm really passionate about Anthony Tapia's work. I've known him, he was my father-in-law, so it's, it was very engaging, you know, at, the, at, the, at a certain point. And, but now it's, it's very helpful, yes, because I, have, I don't have a cold look, but I have like a half-cold look. In Let's between. say I can be a little bit colder regarding so, to some decisions that we have to take once in a while like the one about the new warehouse that we're building, which is, uh, you know, to take the work out of the studio, which is, um, it's, it's an incredible place, but it's not safe, it's not in good condition. So we have to decide, okay, let's get professional, let's take the work out, out of there. But it can be very difficult emotionally because it's also to empty the studio. So you have so to... So the warehouse is where he worked, the, the one yeah. you have to empty, okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's heartbreaking. But at the same time, we really understand that if we want to go further, we, have, we really have to take these steps because this is our future, you know, and it's, it's the, 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 the estate is there. So we really have to yes. take care of it. And, and also in some, uh, in some positions, uh, you know, in some situations, sometimes the family is very, very emotional, but you have to take decisions outside, outside of that and mm. say, you know, you have to, 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 to manage, you have to work, you have to pull together exhibitions. And, and it, it's good for them that they, they're not in the front line. Yes. You know, and to, they, they have the right to have their pain, they have the right to be angry or to be happy or to be, because that's the space, is still mm. family, it's still their father, their husband. So I think it's very, very important to protect this as well. So the family is involved, but yet they, mm -hmm. they still need their, their private space yes. yeah. and then I mean listening to that and, and Adam I'm going to turn to you now because we've heard about all these different parties and foundations and arms and authentication mm -hmm. and family members where does a gallery fit into all of this or where do you see a gallery well I frankly think that being involved with estates and foundations as a dealer <laughs> is as important to my work on a day-to-day -day basis as things that I do in terms of sales, um, getting museum shows, collector relationship, etc. Um, 
there is no handbook to it. And most dealers like myself are people that are inherently creative individuals, many who are sort of, I don't like the term failed artists, but let's say recovering <laughs> artists. But we don't come to it naturally with a business sense. However, we do have a passion for the artists and their work, and we want what's in their best interest. Um, one of the things, and I'm reminded of Ossian's conversation earlier, which is that he started talking about archives. And, you know, it's never too early to have that conversation about estate planning with artists. And is it difficult, though, because people... It's, I mean, you're basically saying to someone, think about when you die. Absolutely. Mortality is a very scary issue yeah. for all of us. I will tell you, it's much harder to have that conversation with an artist in their 70s and their 80s than ah. it is mm -hmm. with an artist in their 30s. But it allows them enough perspective down the road to really think that every decision that they make now with regard to either their work, their ephemera, the materials that they have, may have some sort of consequence down the road. Um, I'm very fortunate because we work with a large group of artists who are in their 70s and their 80s, some of whom have absolutely meticulous, airtight um, mm, well, archives like and have since the 1960s. <laughs> and it just goes to the root of understanding how these individuals really feel about their art and how the legacy of their work was as important to them as their practice was at that particular time. They're really thinking about the arc of their career. And being able to understand that big picture is really important. Because then what you can do is you can sit down and have very consequential conversations with artists too, who haven't thought about things like, you know, is this going to be a sunset foundation or an eternal foundation? You know, what are we doing here? What is your wish? Do you want to have a body of work that is sustained throughout time by which we can constantly have inventory to loan to museums? Or do you want to sell things off and start a grant-giving organization like Joan Mitchell did to give grants to young artists and start a residency center in New Orleans? Um, those kind of issues are important to discuss with artists while you're dealing with their material. Uh, it's also to understand sort of when the artists get older, OK, how much inventory do you have? How much longer are you producing? What does it take? I mean, the real deep details about how are we going to start disseminating what you have into the market and what are we going to hold back? You know? How do you decide what you're going to start? Or is that always part of a conversation? It's a bigger conversation, and it has to do with the volume of work, um, the work that's sort of more recent and experimental, the things that they made in 1965 that never sold that when a gallery does its job mm -hmm. within a state of foundation and really goes around with a magnifying glass and says, wow, nobody's ever shown this body of work that Philippe did you know, way back. This is so fascinating. And there's so many artists who are working out of this kind of tradition. It would be great to show their historical significance and really build a market for this area, this repository that we have that may or may not have market value at mm -hmm. that time. Um, there are also issues that you have to ask yourself with regard to tax consequences. You know, are we going to be a charitable foundation or are we going to be in a charitable foundation for ourselves? You know, <laughs> are we going to make it our mission to buy back work in the market, you know, at market value and so that we have these for great museums that want to acquire things do, that do maybe... Do many foundations do that? Um, that would probably be a question for Christy. <laughs> um, I just know what we deal with and... Everything, like every artist, is completely individual. Uh, there were some things that Louise Bourgeois sold very early on because she needed the money. And the foundation was very anxious to get them back because they filled certain gaps in the collection of things that could be loaned to museums. You can't tell a complete story without these objects. And um, that is part of their sort of arrangement and part of their, um, what they want to do. It's a priority for them. You know, are you selling work to build an endowment or are you selling work simply to cover operating costs? Um, do you authenticate? Does the gallery authenticate? What is your role in this? I mean, we are so linked to the Artist Foundation conversation that I feel like they can't do it without us and vice versa. And that kind of scaffolding only makes an artist and an artist's 
profile stronger. And I'm so glad that we have organizations like Christie's, and I, that means Christie McClear, not Christie's <laughs> The Auction House, <laughs> and our galleries that have experiences with so many different kind of artists and building foundations that we realize there is no one industry standards, but we've come across so many different variables that we know what to ask. And that's super important. Thank you. I'm going to pick up on a couple of things, but I would li I'd like to hear Chris about Christie's business, <laughs> uh, Christie's business at Sotheby's. Um, but I mean, uh, Christie, what did make you make what we thought was quite a major decision to, to go to AAP, and how's it going? Yeah. Um, and where do you see an auction house fitting into all of all of this? So. Um, I was the first director at Rauschenberg, and before that, I was the first director at the Philip Johnson Glass House. So I'd actually have done this twice. So for 15 years, I've been enmeshed in, you know, post-death, you know, going through the... I mean, I always say I was in the Glass House, and I'm going through David Whitney's sweaters, and I'm writing the mission statement, and I'm going through Philip Johnson's postcards, and I'm doing the budget and financials. And, you know, uh, this... What is a common thread here is about strategic questions. And advisors, this new field that's emerging, cannot exist without the galleries. So that is one of the most important things. This is not an attempt to eclipse that, but it's an attempt to bring to light an area that I felt like at Rauschenberg, it was very clear to me that there was sort of a lack of professionalization. And sometimes that was taken advantage of. And um, let me give you an example of that. So the gallery does an excellent job at managing the, uh, the market, the, the artwork, the, the, uh, pro you know, the exhibitions, long-term and short-term versions, scholarship. And your lawyer or your tax advisor can manage the legal structure and the estate formation. But so many of these questions need to happen in order to advise both parties. And these were the things that I was noticing could have been taken advantage of and that mm -hmm. we um, are certainly advising. And so um, I've been, uh, I decided to join AAP because I'd been there for seven years and, and I had been speaking um, on behalf of the Aspen Institute. And it was very clear to me that there was a big opportunity to go out and help people and um, I was talking to Tad, and I was talking to a man who I have great respect for, Alan Schwartzman. And he said, look, it, we have this advisory arm as part of AAP. It is separate in location and in practice from Sotheby's. Um, we structured it so that I'm remunerated not on sales, but on a monthly fee, like a staff person. Mm -hmm. And when I work with a gallery, we don't take a cut. So that's very, the motivations are aligned properly. And so I, f I felt like I was, you know, I lack a fear gene and I'm a business person. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to do this. And for one year, I'm going to verify that this works, that there's a market. And the second year, I'm going to innovate. And I'm going to bring principles from the outside business world in. That's now, isn't it? Now and we're that's in the second year. Now that's we're in exciting. the second year. And the first year, what I found was... Uh, more demand than I ever expected. And I mm -hmm. invite all of you to please take some of these services and integrate them into your galleries. But you're, so you, but you're, not, you're not out there <coughs> trying to win artists. Honestly, we, I, they're coming in the door. I have not gone out to even mm -hmm. begin marketing. And there's a small firm which has started in New York, and we're giving them business. So I have 13 mm -hmm. artists, and I have five more in contract, and I am turning them away because... You have to be very dedicated and focused, and we're hiring people. And I hope that the people who work um, for Alan and I mm. become the next foundation directors. Mm. I hope that they learn from the questions and the strategies that we're asking, that we're populating the field. Um, the second year, what I'm hoping to do this year is look at things like economies of scale. So it's a, it's a young field, but it's a field that, like all businesses, can benefit from, um, could there be a multi-artist foundation? Mm -hmm. So, for example, photographers. Photographers have the same cost basis as maybe, you know, a Rauschenberg foundation, but their, you know, their sales costs are, or, you know, their, their revenues are lower. Uh, yes. And what I have learned in doing what I've been doing for the last year is, 
um, many times the families take over the estate and they may not be business people and their costs get too big uh, they have three storage places, and they have an office, and they have you know two staff people, and then they have to sell to meet these financial expectations. So you know some of that is about you know management consulting. Let's let's go in and renegotiate the storage and fix the budget, and then you don't have to sell. You know sell in in an appropriate way that meets your vision and your mission. Um, so I think that a multi-artist foundation is something I'm hoping to establish. And another is bringing outside tools in from other industries. So could we use a donor-advised fund in order to facilitate philanthropy? Can you explain that a bit? Yeah, it's a, um, it's a tool that's the biggest method for... Uh, uh, Elaine, you could probably help me. It's a, it's a <laughs> tool that, that uh, or most banks have them, and you can... Uh, move your stocks or your money into the donor advised fund and then it will give the grants. So I know some artists and they want to give away grants but they don't like to do the paperwork. Yes. But that's actually illegal. <laughs> like it can be a problem um, because grant making is actually quite a serious Seriously. phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And so it would be better for them to use a donor advised fund and then let somebody else do the paperwork. Mm -hmm. And that's just a matter of adapting a, hmm. you know, an investment tool into our art uh, industry. So I'm learning a lot, and um, I think there are many ways in which the galleries um, can ask some of these long-term questions mm -hmm. and uh, take some of these responsibilities to, uh, you know, be responsible for even more than the market, maybe even, you know, advising the estate in ways that they can be financially responsible, and it affects how you sell. So. But there must be, I suppose maybe I should ask Natasha, Helen, when you hear this as... as Directors or managers of the estates, when you do, you sometimes wonder, you know, what is what is the business? What's the business in it? You know, galleries and auction houses. There must be money being made as well, and having that balance between maybe a charitable foundation and the needs of the market. How do you strike that? How do you see why? Why is it all such big business from oh, your point of view? Well. Um I mean, I mean, uh, the 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 foundation is uh, not for profit, so mm -hmm. the foundation needs mm -hmm. money. Actually, mm -hmm. it's okay. a money, and uh, the 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 family is for profit. So actually, it's uh, we're not going on a sellout here, but still, we have to to have this idea that this is what we we don't we don't have a exhibition space. Uh, yeah. it, it's not what we're doing. But also, we, we're keeping this part of the of the estate uh, to make it available for curator, for investigator. You know, if they if they want to work, this is this will be open. You know, to, for for people to come and do some research. I'm mm. not saying that we're going out and sell, as I was saying. Maybe uh, we we used to work with galleries, and now we've slowed it down. And this is very clear that we want to kind of retain a little bit. Uh, there's one uh, one big myth about the death of the artist is when an artist dies, prices mm. rises, uh, which is not true mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. and the demand is not rising. Mm, no, there's a, there's some sort of a step back. Like everybody's watching, everybody is nobody want to act, and they're to all checking what's how happening. The will so I mm. thought that this time out was very good for us actually, mm. but it's really we really need to take this step back, look at what we have. And, and actually, as the, f as the family was for profit at this, uh, so this was the, this, the, the family actually was where the, the gallery would come and pick the work for, mm. for their uh, exhibition. So the work that we have is kind of random. It's not like in the foundation, they have a very good con uh, collection, sorry, that is uh, in line. Uh, you can really play this art history with what's happening in the foundation. What we have is full of gaps and it's not perfect and sometimes we don't really understand what we have in our hands. And so, yeah, so we're not throwing that on the market. We want to step back a little bit and see uh, what's going to happen. But so. is it fair to say, I suppose, maybe Helen, you to ask if, if an artist foundation is in order or if an artist estate is in order, will that market, will that market be better? I mean, because then you're, then people aren't buying. People don't have to worry about a, maybe a, a stepchild appearing and having a different mm -hmm. opinion or someone saying that's not authentic. I mean, is it fair to say that when an estate is in order, 
It's better for the market. I would like to answer f at your yes, question. Yes, sorry, yes, I'm asking it's, twice, it can two be at once. Complimentary. Actually, in our case, for example, uh, for us, it was really important to keep the work of my father alive. That was our goal. So it was not a commercial goal. So what we did, and it's important for estates, we did like an ABC catalogation for the work. So we said, this is A works, this is only for museums, this is for the market, and this is for the <laughs> estates. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that you work on a horizontal, horizontal level and not vertical. So it means that you have from every period, you keep works. I, I think you know, you know all the example of the Hartung Foundation mm. that uh, when Hartung died, they decided we will focus on the works of uh, the 60s, who were very, very popular. So they say mm -hmm. we will keep it, and now it changed. Hmm. So they, they really they, they focused on a vertical way, so it's very hmm. important. And something I also want to say on the market thing mm -hmm. is that um, it's not because uh, you work with the market that it's a commercial thing, because <laughs> I, I really think um, with an estate, we always have this triangle. If, if you want to keep an estate alive, and if you want to uh, keep an artist alive, actually, because somewhere it's the same. Um, you have to have this triangle of market, yeah. museums, and academy world. And these three have to work together. And that's the only way, if you can make these three work together, that it will keep alive for a living artist and for a dead artist. And, so, and this market, is it's essential to keep it alive, not only to, to have money. And that's something that we have to understand um, in an estate, because sometimes there's like a kind of artist children, they're like, oh, we're not commercial. Of the market, yeah. But it's just, it's a reality. Hmm. You, need, you need to be in the market to be seen, then museums, museum directors see it, they hmm. bring it in a show, the, uh, the academic hmm. world, they work on it. So it's really, it works together all the time, and a healthy, a healthy estate works all That's the time. That's totally like that. true, and yeah. I'll augment that by saying, um, I think it's, it is helpful to the market, if the estate or the foundation is really organized. Yeah, it assists with the catalog resume. Yeah. It assists with the ability to look at different movements of the artist's career and where do you focus. Huh. Um, but um, I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come back. It'll come, yes. back. It'll come back. When it comes back. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I just want to, to yeah. add about the, our, um, our company and the, and the foundation. What's, what's interesting also in our case is that uh, because we are we are more flexible, we don't have a space, we don't have this kind of mission, we have a very long-term mission, but we are very flexible. So we are able to go out there in the world and to meet people and to put together exhibition and to work very, very quickly, hmm. you know? While the foundation has this mission about representing the work by living artists at the same time. Okay. So they're really in the now, you know, what's yes. what is happening now, yes. why, why we are focusing on the future. And we work, we're trying to work as much as possible together and to make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, we have this uh, museum part because the foundation has probably a better way to talk with foundations and, and museums while we are able to do some very spontaneous things. So I think this is interesting mm -hmm. also to be able to put that together. What we are doing, us, is possible to be done by, by galleries, actually, yes. which mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, to yeah. the, the, the gallery maybe can have a, a good relationship with other galleries, with uh, museums, but if there's a foundation, sometimes the foundation is in some sort of an awkward position to work yeah. with galleries and, mm -hmm. you know, market and art fairs, you know, these kind of things. <laughs> so the gallery, oh. you can be the bad boys. Yes. I sorry. had a really interesting conversation um, with the heir of uh, an estate, uh, the Feel son. Feel free to name it. Um, Alina Shapochnikov <laughs> and uh, Pyotr Stanislavsky is the son. And um, he's really interesting because the way he looks at this is, um, and he's not somebody that I work with, but somebody I really respect and I have deep respect for Alina's work hmm. on a lot of levels. But um, in our conversation, we came to this agreement that essentially, um, you know, there's this real Chinese wall that exists. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you do this, and I do that. And mm -hmm. we're in constant communication. We're like this. That mm -hmm. was the hand gesture he used about his relationship with the gallery. Yeah. They're not adversarial. They must work together yeah, in order to true. enhance things. And I think that as long as people understand that that's the goal that you're after, 
you know. And the I goal think is what we're all understanding to be managing an artist's legacy. Yeah, this I is mean, about art. This is about big. people. The whole business yeah. is built on relationships. You know, I always, I often come back to this really wonderful. Um, it was a commencement address that Eric Fischel gave in 2012 at the uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where he talks about what it's like being an artist and the role of an artist as he's seen it evolve from, you know, being a young artist in Nova Scotia to the present day, where he is an international superstar par excellence. And he, he refers to this term of, you know, long before there was even an art business. You know, there was the art world, and the art world consisted of, of a bunch of people, and these bunch of people really were interested in being surrounded by artists and art mm -hmm. and doing the most that they could within that environment. And I think that you really have to keep that as a core value when you decide how you're going to proceed in this area because I think that will always... Th this sense of integration, that we're all part of this art world, will always prevent you from stepping on one another's toes. Um, and then maybe that's when there are challenges and when it does go wrong. Is people will love people to go aren't. to me and see if they can access a show, and they'll go to the foundation. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we can call one another and say, look, did you talk to so-and-so? <laughs> did you talk to <laughs> so-and-so? Yeah, what did you say? Or the foundation, uh, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, for instance, which is extremely well organized at this point, mm -hmm. many, many years after Joan's death in 92, um, it's very clear we cannot even submit catalog raisonné material on behalf of clients. It needs to go directly. That is Susie Villager's mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. She is an expert mm -hmm. in this. Um, she did the Hans Hoffman catalog okay. raisonné. That is something that I would never get involved with. I would never authenticate. They don't authenticate. We have this agreement. People mm -hmm. come to us. This is how it's handled. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as you're on the same page, mm -hmm. it can be a mm -hmm. very harmonious relationship. And then just I just wanted to pick up on... Um, David Judas said something earlier about, you know, this, it's not about the, the archives as much as it's about the artist. And then I was thinking about, you know, are we maybe some of the photographers in a multi family maybe we don't need everyone's stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there an argument <laughs> that, that there are going to be too many estates formed now because of this craze? Well, <laughs> not everybody no. needs a foundation. <laughs> and foundations are quite expensive. Uh, there's, uh, mm. there's, uh, yes. Tax reporting and legal reporting, and there there are so many um, things, unexpected costs associated with a foundation, and that's another reason why asking these questions when you're living it can uh, drive different decisions, different mm -hmm. models, um, and so I, I actually think that's that's quite important. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also every artist has his context. Also, you have artists who are very important locally, for example, mm -hmm. and then. So that's something that I also always say when I advise the children or the wives. I say, um, you really have to be realistic. What is, what's his place also in the world? Is he an international artist? Mm -hmm. Is he important in the local scene? And and sometimes because maybe everybody wants their of course to be an international. And as, as a child, your your father, for mm. example, is the best artist in the world. So it's normal. And that's why I say just invite other people also to come in and to have their advice because you're so subjective. And it's really important to know where, where you stand because otherwise you will always have the door against your, your nose. You know, you, you will always and you will be very disappointed. So it's so important. And so we don't need estates on international level, all the artists, yeah, don't, no. you know, yeah. but on all different levels, you have artists who are very important for their intellectual discourse. Huh. Maybe less their works, but their discourse can be um, very important. So it, it can be very var varied. Mm. Yeah. So I actually can imagine that um, because there's sort of this enormous boon of artist estates, that college and university museums will actually be more important in the future. Huh. And the yeah. reason I say yeah. that is, yeah. you know, everybody originally wants to be in, you know, uh, the best museum. I want to be in the Pompidou. I want to be in the Matter MoMA. And the fact of the matter is, and this goes back to what I forgot, which is <laughs> it's about the importance of scholarship and connecting to a younger generation. Yeah, absolutely. And so one thing as a dealer that you can ask is map the ages of the scholars for your artists yeah. and see how old they are or where they are on the time spectrum. But, you know, a college and university museum not only will hang the work and, and hold the work up. It won't go into a basement, 
but they'll build classes around the artwork, and then they're getting into the sort of hearts and minds of younger people, and that's where you're reconnecting with another generation. So I, I'm a big believer that college and uh, university museums are going to be... Learning anything where you can tap into a younger true. generation. Yeah. 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 But I, I just want, because you were talking about stuff, do we need... Uh, that much that stuff, much stuff. <laughs> yes. is uh, but that we were talking about earlier about the fact that uh, an, an artist's estate is tough. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of uh, painting, sculpture, videos, whatever it is, Pest lost cards. objects uh, that you don't know if it's art or it's not art or is it part of the archives or not. All the archives, all, all of this, all this stuff, houses, you know. But I think that, and one, one of the big challenges that we have also is that an artist's estate is also all the people that has been working around the artist. And we never talk about them, but they are paramount. And it's, mm. uh, they're very, very important. And actually, like, like Tapies, uh, around his death, there were like some people died a little bit before and some people a little bit after. So we were kind of left with some sort of a wood with no trees hmm. because really we, we kind of lost uh, some very, very important people in the way and some of his friends and his son and actually uh, some people, uh, Leslie Waddington that he used to work with, uh, Daniel Lelong just now hmm. is uh, retiring. They've been working with Tapies for more than 30 years. Like it's a marriage, like 30 <laughs> years working together. And these people, they're going away a little bit at a time with all their pieces and of, of memories. And you have mm -hmm. also all the people who are working in the studio, those people with their skills that they know th how to restore things. Uh, Tapias oh, yeah. would use that, these products, these things. People working in transportation, how to, you know, all of these people. Yes. And they are part of your estate. So yes, it's really important to, well. to really... Sure. Ang Make sure that you kind you will not be able to keep all their memories, all their things, but still, there is something that's really important to manage and to go to the next generation. And because you can have a, some sort of a clash of uh, generation, because you have people who knew the artist and new people coming in, and then it's like, I knew how it was supposed to be, yes. and other people, it's not how we do things anymore, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, it can be. It's, he would have hated Instagram. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, would, it would have never accepted this, or it would have never accepted this exhibition like this. I knew him, you know? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And what actually is, if we are touching on, you know, how to reach younger people, I'm going to ask just before I open it up to your questions. Um, if each of you had one bit of advice, either for a young, a living younger artist or a, a gallerist, of something they could do now to, to make this work better for the future. I don't know if you're going to have a different bit of advice. Documentation, but what documentation. Different? Yeah, make sure that you have pictures of everything, well documented and everything. Then. One day, the catalog raisonné will be easier, mm -hmm. and then uh, certification and everything, because mm. if you have proof that it was done, and you have, uh, and where it goes, you yeah. know, to have, uh, yeah, it's important. Christy? I have sort of an abstract thing, um, and I was mentioning it to you earlier, which is I'm a big believer in um, thinking 100 years out, huh. meaning how do we pass the baton beyond the people who knew him or loved him. And I think that that's about getting the people who do know you and worked yeah. with you for 30 years to help you define what your legacy is through values. And um, I was saying earlier that Rauschenberg's values that we braided into the mission statement helped us make decisions so that it didn't have to be owned by five people. And those were, is this collaborative? Is this risk-taking? Is this creative problem serving? Is it global? And if it didn't meet those criteria, you had to go back to the drawing board. Hmm. And, and those are different values for Donald Judd than they are for any other artist. And that helps, you know, really free a lot of the decisions that you can do uh, while you're living, you know, with your yeah. people. So. Great. I mean, the one thing that comes to mind is that there is no question or path of reasoning that is not worth taking when it comes to issues of the gallery's role with estates and foundations. There are always things that can be explored during the lifetime and afterwards. Um, there are always avenues whereby there was a stretcher maker who made something and they called you because so-and-so gave them a piece. I mean, that's a relationship 
And as the dealer, our first instinct is, damn, this person might want to sell it, you know? <laughs> but the second question is, this is a relationship of super valuable worth to our gallery, where they might have knowledge and insight and all sorts of questions that can empower me to have a conversation with museum curators and collectors and with the foundation to enhance the message that we're trying to tell about the artist. So it's far more than just dollars and cents or euros or pesos or whatever. You've almost convinced me of that. <laughs> and Alan? Well, I think it's, it's very interesting what you say about the values because it's true as an artist, uh, it's, I think it's important not to fix too much uh, already what you want because oh. I'm just saying um, for example in the case of my father my mm. father he became actually more famous after his death and if he would have fixed things yeah. I think he mm. would have been um, yeah we, we couldn't have done the things that we did yeah. now and also something very important is mm. that a reading of a work changes all the time and yeah. it needs to, to keep it alive it needs to be um, relevant mm. So if you fix too much a reading of a work, it dies. Because it, a work lives in relationship with, 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 with the audience. And that's something that's also very important. And I think if you can work with values, mm -hmm. it's much broader and yeah. you, can, you can go different directions. So Thank you very much. And are there any questions uh, to this fantastic panel? Are there any questions out there? Oh, there's one, just, oh, there's one, two, three. Georgina. Okay, I'll, Hi there. I'll, I'll launch. Oh, 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 oh let's, we'll just go with Georgina, sorry. Oh. Yes, and then we'll come to you. Please launch. Um, authentication. I mean, that's been an absolute a number of estates have closed their authentication mm -hmm. boards. Um, it's just like a few comments on that mm. because that's been such a problematic it area. It worked. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. well. I mean, uh, but in, in our case, uh, we, we feel for the moment very secure about it because we have the, the catalogue raisonné is very well done. Actually, uh, where we have more problems, you know, about fakes and this kind of thing is mo mostly on internet and on very, very small things, which is like posters or some fake drawings, but they are very sold for cheap. So for, for the moment, we are, we're working, we have meeting, the commission and I is meeting every month and it's it's very serious and for the moment we think that it's it's secure i know there are some some other uh certification process that have been very complex or very complicated for the moment we're still we we have this question that is it forever can you pass it on forever i think that there's a moment that it starts to become a bit difficult as you lose people who, mm. who knew the work Yes. Like we still have the the, the widow Teresa, yes, so she true. she's not uh, every month with us. But when we have a big doubt, sometimes we just bring the work, and she's like, she really she remembers. Knows. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's it's really amazing. So we still have that. And did you authenticate it? The uh, we did not. No. And, and was that a very um, conscious decision? We got we took it all the way to the finish line. We had all the papers. And we had the the whole panel, and we realized we didn't honestly have an authentication problem. Like we didn't have the problem Warhol had. So yes. it was really around sort of onesies and twosies. But um, I think authentication in America is different. You know, it's a, it's a, it's yeah. a legal mor morass mm. and it can be a huge financial hindrance. So I'm keeping my eye and my friend back there from Berlin also is, uh, I'm interested in technology and how technology will affect this, whether it's mm. blockchain. Yes. Uh, and I and we don't know this yet, but it is something for you all to keep your eyes there out are on. Some interesting I, I do think that that projects. is going to be yep. something that will take it beyond, huh. you know, just again, who knew, you know, whether it was made by them or not. So. Hmm. Also, it's completely different in America and Europe also. Oh, yeah. In America, mm -hmm. you have another law system. Mm -hmm. In Europe, we have the moral rights. Yeah. It's, it's yes. changed it's completely, of course. And in America, even if you win the, the court, the, the rechts, I You don't still know. lose. Yeah, yes. you still <laughs> lose because you have to pay. Money. In Europe, yeah. it's different. So yeah. I think in Europe, there's a lot of uh, states who does authenticate. Yes. In America, they don't. And I think actually it's important to authenticate for the for the for the artist. Mm -hmm. It's very important because um, 
if you just uh, if you don't authenticate what credibility does does the artists yeah. have in the market but um, let's see also the future what is it? maybe it won't be even a such yeah, a big but I, issue I think, anymore. I think that you're, what you ha where you have to be very clear is who's in charge of it. Mm. So is who's in charge? Because we That's we've met issue. false certificate yeah. as well. That's so which issue. is uh, you have you have people mm -hmm. have they really have to know. But that's and like who's doing it. It has to be very that. official and to make sure yeah. that they really know. Yes, well. but that's incredibility the you create. You cannot you you cannot um, say I'm now uh, the one who will authenticate. It's something that grows. Yeah, well, no, no, but I mean, but when you go in the secondary market, you have certificates okay. were made by galleries or some people. I, I mean, it happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we will so always okay. defer to the estate or foundation. And if they would prefer that we not do it, then we don't do it. Mm -hmm. But that's part of our conversation. And frankly, we work for them. Sure. So um, we give them our advice and we yes, it's, uh, you come to an agreement that works, that's yeah. amicable. And it's always in the best interest of, you know, what their mission statement is, what their core values are. Is yeah. this important to them? Um, and some it is and some it is not. Meantime, documentation. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there was a question in the back there. Yes. Hi there. Thanks. This Hi. is uh, absolutely fascinating to me. Um, I work closely with an artist in his mid-60s, and I've encouraged him for ages to do just what you're saying, and there's been this resistance, and I think probably something to do with the fact that he would have to face his mortality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder um, what your advice is uh, that I can give him from you know, your perspective. Where do I start in trying to convince him? Does he have a family? He has a I family. think this is very important. Yeah, Does he yeah. have like hairs? I he think has you, you start yes. So yeah, you have to there. work to he start has with them. Yeah. yeah, he has to take care of them. And buy oh, that true. book. And buy, buy that book. book. <laughs> <laughs> it gives, gives you all the questions to ask. Mm. I mean, that's a genuine. No, but I'm it's interested in your anecdotes. You know, maybe it's a very enough. personal conversation, guess, yeah. and it's something that um, it's very easy for people to turn to their attorney. Hmm. who will put together oh. something <laughs> and they yeah. will merely sign it because they want yeah. it off their table yeah. and it may not be something that they thoroughly understand or is in the best interest of their legatees. Yeah. It'll and be uninspired. Completely. Yeah. And it may be, frankly, against the culture of you know their existence as an artist and their work, etc., and they may just not have entered into sort of a broader conversation of what the yeah. options are. Is there a way of asking uh, but mortality the question? Is, is, is there a way of asking him the question that you know, sort of is rather than what do you want to do when you die? Is there a <laughs> yeah. way of sort of saying, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah, how yeah. would you love to be remembered? Well, some or I people just can. I think it's true. How you ask the questions uh, is is everything. So mm -hmm. it's really it can be your last symphony. I mean, you can sort yeah. of look at it like I'm working with a living artist, and we're working on uh, expanding his philanthropy and starting up a residency in a village. Yeah. And and it was really about um, asking inspiring questions and mm -hmm. talking about things that he loved and talking about things that mattered and pulling out words that inspired him mm -hmm. and thinking and taking tours of places that he loved and then. Really, that was about not about death. It was yeah. about living, yeah. Yeah. and so it was about how could you know the last. He's young. He's sixty-seven. How yeah, you know you, four, maybe forty years. Who yeah. knows? Maybe but that's more. you know like let's make something really big happen. It could be your biggest creative hmm. gesture. And I mm. yes. that's you know I don't mean to be trite, but yeah. but no. I think he's really really yeah. into it, and it's great. Yeah. So that getting that inspiration yeah. out. Uh, I would say two things as well. Uh, first one is it can be the door to their immortality, you know, somehow. Huh. So thi mm. this can be very interesting and important. And the other thing is not doing it or not or not taking care of it properly. It, it might be the worst gift he will left to his children. Mm. So this is very, very important because you can leave this big... Uh, a mess. state very yeah big oh. mess or but if there's no if you I didn't think about the money or if the estate is separate into many people i mean you you really have to figure that out it is it is very yeah. important especially because this artist has monumental pieces i think it would be yeah. a big burden for well, his well give you i'll yeah. give you for instance um when i first got out of college i worked for an artist who was extremely temperamental and um he worked in additions Okay, a five. Yeah. And he was so controlling of the world that he only ever wanted to make two out of all the five. And he had a very contentious relationship with his son. 
and um, they never got along. They barely spoke. And he wouldn't acknowledge him, and he wasn't interested in creating a foundation or anything to help this kid out. Guy dies. He's next of kin. The son inherits it, okay? And now he's convinced his dealer to finish all the additions because he wants to cash in on all the hell that his father put him through. Mm -hmm. And this is clearly <laughs> against <laughs> what the yes, father wanted. wanted. Yeah. Exactly. I think you raised something really important is that people are irrational. <laughs> and when they are into their emotion yeah. and their parents thing, and it's, uh, you know, we are in a very delicate subject here. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And sir, was it? Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi. Oh, would you mind just waiting for the microphone? Thank you. Thank you for uh, it's it's great. Thank you. <laughs> but um, is it like that that for a gallerist, a gallerist who works with an artist, an artist is never dead, never dies. Hmm. It means when you as gallerist die then it's finished. But um, the problems, the, the most problems for the artist are after death. And what I see, it's always the family, not the gallerist. <laughs> because when they have <laughs> troubles, it's during life. Then there are discussions. And I see the, an, an artist can be, can be dead two times. Mm -hmm. Two times. Is that and his work, and I see a lot of uh, artists, good artists, and it's after 20 years still the problems with lawyers and all the situations. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very sad story, Absolutely. and Thank I, th you. I think it's not in the academies. Not uh, we don't. Uh, um, it's <laughs> it's very difficult to <laughs> explain yeah. for me. Um, but I myself, I'm in the, from the generation too, that uh, this year to 50 years I exist, means in 50 years people die, people. Uh, and I see, and I'm very happy to hear that, I think the, the future for an artist is when young people are interested in the artist. That That's like right, Philippe point. van der Berg. A, a lot point. of young, are, I think it's very important and do and you have a question as well? Or but the, you no, the question is <laughs> that, uh, that uh, thank you uh, for this information. <laughs> okay. I think we'll it, should be, it should be necessary <laughs> that academies and art institutes and, and uh, that they do more to warn the, the people and uh, to talk about uh, problems like that. Yeah, yeah and that thank is and that's what a lot of these people Thank you. I would like to thank react you. also... Adrian, on what you said that the family are the worst. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, you should react. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can understand. But, you know, can you imagine? It's, it's a business, eh? It's a business, and actually, it's the only business in the world when the, the, the owners of the business dies, the ones who heritage it, they're not prepared. If you think your father is a big businessman, a banker, yeah. you he, can you be sure that everything is for these gallerists one, that we heard he's trained or he has a whole group of people who are trained to advise him. With an artist, it's not like this. An artist, one, as you said, he wants to be immortal. So creation, creation is to be immortal somewhere. So you, he won't speak about his dad and not with his children. And mm -hmm. these children, sometimes they have a bad relationship with the father, with the artist. It's, it's yeah. very difficult. Yeah. Uh, the, an artist parent, is, it's quite conflictual. So um, it's, yeah, it's <laughs> somewhere normal, yeah. this situation, that they're not prepared. And even if they would like to do it, there's nobody who learned them to, to do this, yeah. this thing. So that's why, actually, now we, yeah. we, we try to yeah. give yeah. them... Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I think I've we got time for father. one more question <laughs> before. Uh, yes, before you have to. Was it? Oh, oh go ahead. yes. Sorry, this gentleman. And then okay. come and grab us Hi. after. Thank you. Yes. So Hi. I have a question. I'm very, it's very, for me, it's very interesting. Um, what do you think about these situations that, for example, an artist has been working for a gallery for over 40, 50 years, then the artist died, the gallery is still 
but then a bigger gallery comes and takes everything. Mm -hmm. Adam? I think there are two sides to that equation. Um, no. I wasn't familiar with Philippe Vanderberg's work during his lifetime. But I have to tell you, I find it some of the most interesting and joyful work that I've seen in the last decade. And I really have to hand it to the gallery because I, I, they've exposed the work to a huge audience, to so many artists. They brought it to North America. It's something that was covered internationally by press. And um, I don't know the story before. I don't know if there was a gallery that handled his work regularly and if they lost an opportunity there. All I know is I've been in both places, yeah. so I understand. And there's a lot of resistance. But I know that this has changed the perception of Philippe Vanderberg's work on an international level. And I don't think that that would have happened otherwise. Hmm. Again, I've also hmm. been in the other position. And um, I think it has a lot to do with what galleries independently can offer. Hmm. And you know, yes, some are suited to do things, and some well. maybe don't have the resources to do it. Um, I think it's a, a very individualistic situation. Thank you. Well, I think, I mean, my uh, sort of uh, what I've taken from everything is how individual everything is, how there, you know, maybe, maybe there's the same questions to ask, but the answers are always going to be very different. Um, and I, w I think I'm going to end my lasting memory of this is Natasha's um, human beings are irrational. No, I hope so. um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think with that in mind, I just want to say thank you very, very much, Natasha, Christy, Adam, Helen. You've been superb, and thank you all for your time. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very thank much. You.